Welcome to Play by Players, an MLSPA podcast. Now here's your host, former MLS player, Bobby Boswell. Hey everybody, it's been a, a little while since we've done one of these, but uh, we're back. And when I say we're back, we're back with someone that really has, uh, has represented MLS and uh, we go back before MLS. It's uh, U.S. soccer, U.S. soccer on the world stage. And, um, you know, he's a, a Gold Cup champion, a World Cup participant. He's played in the Bundesliga. He's played for a handful of MLS teams, MLS Cup champion. He scored some big goals. Uh, welcome to uh, today's podcast, Mr. Tony Santa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. How is, uh, how is everything going? I know uh, I, I was talking to uh, one of the guys in MLS office yesterday, and I, I told him that, uh, that I was going to be interviewing you today. And he said, oh, you, you're talking about the mayor of Minnesota there? And I, I kind of said, is that, his, is that his nickname? And he says, I mean, that's what we call him around the office. So uh, how's everything going up north? It hasn't snowed yet, so we're doing pretty well. <laughs> um, you know, obviously with COVID and um, the, the Floyd incident, um, things have been tough here. But, you know, we really feel like the community has come together well um, to support each other. Um, it's uncertain times everywhere, but I think it, it's um, we're really surprised and happy with the amount of support that we're getting and that we see people, you know, reaching out to support other people as well. So, Tony, normally we, we start at the beginning with guys and, uh, you know, all joking aside, I could go way back with you. Um, but And I do plan on doing that. But I want to talk about uh, more of what's going on currently. I think uh, your foundation, you know, I want you to talk a little bit about that and how you guys were actually uh, completely ready and, and uh, for COVID and for what's going on in, in the world with uh, racial inequality. Um, talk about some of the things that you have going on and, and you know, like I said, how prepared you guys were and what's really helping the community around you. I don't think you're ever prepared for what we've been this year, but, um, you know, being an athlete, being a part of a team and, and learning to push forward definitely helped prepare me and my staff. Um, you know, first, first of all, COVID, you know, was just unpredictable for anybody. And, you know, here we, you know, we have staff that work in schools, but we also have 26 languages and feed 40,000 people at our community center that, that we run. And so we tried to feed those people and other people saw the line and started to get in it. So pretty quickly, we've said we need more food. And, you know, now we have a fleet of vehicles. We have seven vehicles and we, we did, um, you know, heat mapping and found out where the people are coming from. So we're delivering, you know, we've delivered almost a million pounds of produce. Um, you know, we've hired a lot of young people and, and people of color to come in and do the work. So we've actually increased our staff during this time um, in a safe manner to keep the economy going. Um, and then most recently, you know, when school started, you know, our schools are closed. They're 100 percent distance learning. So we retrofitted our gym into a distance learning center. So parents that need to go to work, that can't afford to stay home um, and can't afford daycare can send their kids to a school where we have tutors. So We've been really acting as a food hub and a child care center um, since COVID started. So um, it's, it hasn't been easy, and, and, um, but we're getting good at it. And uh, if you need food, give us a call. That's, uh, that's awesome. And, and you know, tell, tell people a little bit about you know, your foundation. I, I talk to a ton, of, a ton of guys, a ton of former MLS players. Um, you know, I, I don't think anyone has – has been as successful at, at what you've uh, accomplished. And I know it hasn't been easy, um, you know, from when you retired back in 2010, but uh, what, you're, what you're building seems to be compounding. It seems to be growing a, a lot quicker, almost I call it the snowball effect. Like uh, it started a little slow, but now you've got some real momentum. Um, tell people how you ended up going from being a, a professional soccer player into this, uh, as we call it, the mayor of Minnesota, but someone that's a, a man of the community and, and able to help so many people impact so many lives? Well, I think when I retired, I realized I needed to come back and give something back to the sport. Um, and uh, then, you know, and I always wanted to be involved, but I, I, I wanted to live in Minnesota more um, than I wanted to be involved in soccer at that point in my life. And I moved three years, every three years for, for you know, 17 plus years. Um, and as I thought about it, it wasn't really the soccer piece then. It was, you know, what made soccer great. It was all the great relationships that I built and, and the people that helped me along the way and part of the reasons why I made it. So I went back to school and studied developmental relationships and 
figured if I was going to build an organization around relationships, I had to go where kids were. And so they're in, in three main places and one, they're in schools. So one of our programs, we put mentors in schools, working on developmental relationships, helping kids. But at the same time, I train those staff to get their teacher's license and, and move them ahead in their career. So it's dual track. Um, in the summertime, when we don't have school, we run free sports camps for 8,000 kids. Um, you know, 6,500 of them are soccer camps. Um, and we hire about 150 youth. Um, so we get them coaching license, food, transportation. Um, during COVID, some of them were making more than their parents, you know, making $500 a week in the summer, um, coaching other kids. Um, and then and dual track because we, we have mentors that we're, we're trying to, to, to move forward. And then third is just this community center that we're, that we're running. We're in the middle of a $10 million remodel with, a, you know, dome and you need, you need to be inside in the winter. Um, and then computer labs, food, 26 languages spoken here. Um, so that's the, the cusp of what we do. We, you know, we tie everything to the social determinants of health and the root causes of poverty. Um, but, you know, soccer is, is a part of it. And, you know, it's not the only piece. And if I'm, if I'm real transparent, you know, um, you know, I, I was and had been interested in, in being involved in soccer, but let's just say the opportunities weren't there. Um, and, you know, me and you, we talked about this earlier and, um, you know, when I decided to be a pro soccer player, my mom, you know, started charging me for rent. And, you know, at that moment she was like, what's going on? I said, well, what do you mean? I can't afford that. She's like, well, if you want to be a pro soccer player, you got to make a living. So you're not going to be able to live in my house. And, you know, when I retired from soccer, I, I wished and I hoped to have a, a storybook ending and be able to, to be involved in Minnesota in some capacity. Um, but that hasn't happened. And, and my mom said the same thing. She says, you want to be involved in the game on a professional level, you know, she goes, go out there and do it. She goes, if you don't want to bad enough, you know, you can stay here in Minnesota. And so um, I guess I'd love to be involved in the professional game, but not more than I want to be in Minnesota at this point. And, um, you know, we haven't had that kind of relationship here. So I am, you know, invested in this philanthropy and, and working with kids and, and using, you know, my skill and knowledge base so that, you know, there isn't nothing political about it. You know, I can make every decision on what's best for the kids and the community. Yeah. And for, for those that, uh, you know, hearing what he's talking about, he's, he's, he's done this pitch a lot. Um, and, and he's, he's really under underselling, I think all the services and all the, uh, impacts that they've made in the community. And I, I recommend everyone go to, um, the, the Santa foundation website and look and just, you'd be amazed at what he has created and some of the impacts that they've seen, but you, you kind of gave me a perfect segue, um, talking about your mom and, um, you know, we always like to focus, like I said, on the beginning, um, you know, growing up in, in Minnesota, um, you had a, a father from Gambia and your mother, I, I believe, was from Wisconsin, um, but you end up in, in Minnesota. And, you know, I've, I've done my homework and you kind of talk about that area like it's not a hotbed for soccer, but you won the, I saw a thing where y'all won like the national championship as a youth. Is that, is that accurate? We did. We had, you know, we had the same ragtag group of people from his little community in St. Paul and we, we stayed together. And when we were 19, we won the McGuire cup. And um, that was when there was no DA. So it was, I guess the top uh, youth, you know, championship in the country. And, you know, at the time, you know, it was me and Manny Lagos was on the team. Um, you know, he was, you know, our star player and, and we had a bunch of other guys, but not too many division one players, but just showing you what it, what a team can actually do um, together. And, you know, since then, you know, we've had some players, you know, Leo Cullen, um, ended up, you know, but being at Maryland and went to, went to my high school years after me and, um, obviously was a top draft pick. And more recently, I just saw, you know, um, uh, uh, Caden Clark scored his goal off his first touch. And, you know, I remember seeing him at, at camps and clinics a year back and his family. So congrats to them. And, you know, Jackson Ewell has been doing great. So, you know, there's a handful of guys from Minnesota that are, that are still doing well. And, um, you know, I, I have my heart here and I came back here because, um, this is where my peoples are at. So I, I love seeing the guys from Minnesota do well around the league. Okay. Well, I just, I thought that was ironic. You know, it's not a hotbed, even though we won the national championship. So there's obviously some talent there. I know you're a big part of that. And, uh, you know, you really got your, I say your championship ways going there. Um, you know, and, and we could go through, I don't want to focus too much on, um, I think you've gotten a lot of stock stock questions over the years. Um, a lot of people know about, 
a lot of your championships and a lot of your experience, but I do want to focus on, uh, you know, all the positions you played. You started as a forward at uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, I read that you played goalie and indoor at some point. Love to hear uh, uh, something about that, but, you know, just, just talk a little bit about all the, all the positions. I know, you've get, been moved around all over the place, but I really want to focus more on having an open mind uh, when you go uh, anywhere about positions you have to play. I think, you know, one of the things that let me play for so long was one, my athletic ability and, and, and flexibility. Um, you know, I wasn't always, you know, maybe you can call me difficult, but, you know, I, I was always in it for the team. Um, but I was really good at walking in the locker room, looking around and saying, you know, coach, I used to play this other position if I, if I thought that was the weakest link and, you know, six months later, that's where I'd be playing. Um, and so it, you know, I've always thought, you know, you need to do whatever you can do to help the team. Um, and I think players I played with appreciate that. And, you know, you know, I, I conditioned myself as a, as a world-class role player, you know, I, I did what it took. Um, and, you know, I think I played nine positions from the beginning of national team games and, um, you know, all 10 positions or, or 11, um, you know, throughout my career. Um, but it's been fun. And, you know, I, you know, people say, which is a favorite. It's hard. It's hard to say they all have, I guess it depends on your teammates and, and the roles. And, um, you know, I mean, forward, you know, I grew up playing forward and I still think that, you know, I, I really understand the game as far as, you know, how to make runs. And, you know, because I was so fast, you know, I got opportunities, but I wasn't, let's say a, a clinical or natural finisher, but I, I just created chances by being there. And, um, you know, I think the, the brains of my game maybe was overlooked. And as I got older in my game in, in the years, you know, being able to position myself defensively was the most important. And then, you know, moving to, you know, to join your club to center back and right back um, kind of helped me um, use those brains and, and, and also my positioning. Um, to be effective and, 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 and help the team win. So, you know, I enjoyed it all and I'm happy to do it. And if I had to do it all over again, I'd probably do it the same. That's pretty good. I see. I was the opposite of you. I, I was a, a classical poacher and a lethal finisher, but I didn't have any speed. So the coaches never trusted me up top. So I always had to stay in the back and uh, you know, I had to show my goal scoring ability sometimes on my own team just to prove to the coach I could do it. But um well, I know, I know you talked something that not many people know about, um, and that's what I really, you know, I like to show on my new side. Um, you know, you did battle a lot of injuries. I know you mentioned going to Belgium. Not many people knew that. I think, I think a lot of people know you were one of the first guys in Germany. Um, you know, I was, you know, growing up, I loved the Nuremberg story of how you helped them rise, and I think you became a, a legend there. But um, what, was the, what was the deal with Belgium, and, and, and what happened there with getting injured? Well, you know, I just, I, I kind of left school like, kind of right after my last game as a senior and I was going to go play in Belgium. And, um, and so I was just training and playing with the second team there and I just busted my ankle up really bad. And, and then instead of staying in rehab, I decided to come back and, and go to school. Um, but it was, you know, for me, I, you know, when I was a, a senior, the, the summer before my senior year of college, I was playing in Europe and, um, a team from Belgium, a team from France, a couple of teams had interest in me. So, um, you know, I knew I was going to do it. And, you know, interestingly, you know, when we talk to young people today about, you know, do you want to play? And there's a lot of people on the edge and it only takes one break to make it right. And, you know, you, you hear the, you know, the demerit story and things like that. Um, but, you know, I, I tell young people, you know, if you're not willing to make, you know, $15,000 for the next five years of your life, you know, you can forget about playing pro soccer because there's a million people that are willing to do that. And it's not actually doing it, but it's the commitment to the game, right? You got to be that committed to make it. Um, and so, you know, I was willing to leave school to go and, and try and, and see what it took. And um, it was, you know, leave everybody and everyone you love to go do something. You know, you, you better commit 100 percent. That's all you got at that point. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I think that's why these guys that do go overseas, um, you know, they, they become better people, whether they make it or not. Um, just because I think they appreciate what they have here and realize how cutthroat it is somewhere else. Um, but I, let's talk about you come back. Um, I grew up in Tampa, Florida. 
I used to go to Tampa Cyclone matches. That was when I was in the USISL. I probably watched you play um, if you played against them. I know you started in the, you know, when I say we go way back, I mean, uh, with you, it, it's USISL. Uh, then I think it came the A-League. Uh, I was a Tampa Bay Terror season ticket holder. That was the indoor league. I know you played uh, with the, the Chicago Power, I think, was the team. Um, talk to me about, you know, just – I think when people talk about transition, like people think I'm old for MLS, right? And they say, oh, man, you went through it all. You had that – you got offered that $28,000 contract that I played for three or four years. And I'm like – I'm like, Tony was probably on whatever, like 22 or 24000 whatever it started off at. So uh, talk to me about where you started. And, and, you know, I want to tie it in at the end. But talk to me about where you started and, and how you ended up coming to MLS. Well, you know, I like I said, I've been at every level at the UISL. I played in the Milwaukee Rampage. Me and Brian McBride, you know, out of college then, you know, played on a team there. Um, then he went to Germany actually before. And then we came back for, for Major League Soccer. And, you know, my Adidas rep, this guy Rocky Fresh, I love him. He, he I was young. And, and Rocky was like, you know, Tony, it's like, you got something special, right? And he, people don't know it yet. So, you know, he, I got like a, a contract and he used to give me stuff. Um, and then um, he's like, you know, people really like you at the combine, you know, you're going to go in the first round. And so if you played in the UISL, they, they basically offered you $28,000. I mean, it was just, that was it. And I was like, but you're saying that I'm going to come in and start. So basically I said, no, I'm just going to trust myself and go to Europe. And so I'm like, I'm going to play in the A league one more year and go to Europe in the summer or fall. So I started, you know, playing and um, I think, you know, we played the, I think Dallas and I scored a hat trick, you know, in a preseason game, you know, and we called Sunil and we said, you know, we scored a hat trick against Dallas, you know, can you play? And, you know, he reminded us that we were not going to make up $28,000 in the MLS. Um, and then, uh, you know, Bruce's team, you know, I give him credit really, you know, they, they started on a losing streak and, so they kept calling me. I said, listen, if you think I'm going to be a starter, then why would you offer me $28,000? It just, that doesn't make good business sense. And he's like, I agree, but these are the rules of the league. So um, then I started hearing other coaches, you know, were interested in. So I was, you know, kind of hoping, but I had my mind just get myself ready to go. And then DC United won a game and I didn't hear anything from them. I'm like, okay, then that's over. And then they lost the game. And eventually I got my contract up and, you know, I think I had like a, a base salary of 48 or 36,000 with a signing bonus and playoff money. So it, it ended up being, um, you know, I was going to make, you know, 60,000 at least, and, you know, maybe a 20 in bonuses. And so I signed it. Um, and, you know, all I had to do was play in 75% of the games um, and to get it. So, but at the end of the year, you know, when it came time to redo my contract, they, they, they want to sign me to like a five-year contract. And I said, you told me if I did well, played, started and won the MLS, you'd give me a new contract, you know, not sign more years. And they kind of reminded me that years don't need money. And I'm like, well, why do you want them? So at that point, I just decided, you know what, like, I, I didn't feel good about how it happened the first time. So I said, you know what, I'll just play this out. I can do it for two more years and then I'll leave and, and I, and I can go. So I didn't, um, we had a lot of success the second year again. So at that point, I think I was, you know, one of the the top outside midfielders in the league. And then they tried to re-sign me again. And I think I was asking for 105,000 and they were asking me for a hundred. Um, and then like you, I had some injuries. I had, did my groin, missed the world cup. And I went into Bruce's office every day and took my DVDs and spliced them and made a tape. And we sent them to 10 European clubs and that's how I got my offer for Berlin. And then, you know, my German team, you know, offered me over, it was over a half a million dollar base. And um, so I had to take it. And, you know, after the fact, I think MLS came back and offered me 150, 160,000. And, you know, if they would have went up $5,000, you know, six months before, I, I never would have went to Europe, but they didn't. And, you know, it was surprising that they would only offer me $50,000 more when somebody else, you know, offered it. So, at that point, you know, I, I played nice, but I knew that I had opportunity to go somewhere else and, and try it. And, and I was excited and, but, you know, MLS was awesome for me, um, the beginning and the end of my career. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we both love DC obviously, but, um, 
the team that I grew up with there, um, you know, and, and Marco, Marco to this day, you know, some of the best players I've played with in the world and, and probably one of the best teams as well. Yeah, I mean, for those that uh, that don't know this, I, I used to see you at least, uh, I'd say, three or four times a day because uh, when you walk into – this is RFK now. I'm not sure um, what the new setup is, but they've – I know you're familiar with it. They have the pictures of all the successful teams and all the successful players and, uh, and, and, you know, anyone holding the trophy and you're in a lot of those photos. You're not only in them, you're kind of front and center uh, with your, with your wristbands. And, uh, and so I saw you every day for uh, the whole career. I mean, my whole career in DC, you know, they never took those down that you were uh, kind of one of the legends, you know, of that group. Obviously you have Marco and Jaime and, you know, Eddie and Richie and, and, but the whole group, I mean, everyone in that group is, is, you know, a household name in my opinion, just because of what y'all were able to do. And, um, you know, for those that I don't know how they don't know, um, scored some big goals. You know, I think you scored, uh, in, in the finals where y'all won. I know, uh, I think the biggest victory in MLS and probably U S soccer club history, uh, you were a part of that group. Um, and, and you won, or you scored in that game as well. Can you, you know, can we talk about a game that I don't think gets enough attention? Um, you know, I, I know you know it better than, than anyone. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, that was one of the things is that, you know, I, I did whatever for the team and, you know, first year, I don't know if people know this, but I came and started every game and I got benched in the playoff cause I got hurt and I didn't start in the final, but I came off the bench to score the first goal when we were down two zero and we, we came back and won. Um, the second year I had a goal and assist in DC you know, and that was in front of 58,000 fans and all my friends were in the front row. But the one that doesn't get talked about was, you know, we were in the final of the Inter-America Cup. And, you know, I was coming back after my injury that summer after the World Cup. And, um, you know, after that game, I, I flew to Germany. Um, basically, um, we we played um, Vasco da Gama um, for the championship of the Inter-America Cup. And we were the we, we had beaten all the Mexican teams and we were the North American champions and they were the South American champions. And, you know, for me, it was like a great sending off piece because, you know, I left with another trophy and I knew I could play anywhere in the world. And, you know, that was a really special team to be a part of. And, um, you know, we had, a, we had a lot of good players, a lot of good coaches. And, you know, hopefully that, you know, an MLS team will reach that that pinnacle again. But like I said, we had a really special team and I don't I don't think people will really be able to appreciate it until it happens again. And I don't know if it's going to happen for a while. I, I'm not trying to be rude. I don't think it will because, you know, it's so funny. Nowadays, everyone talks about how, how MLS teams struggle against, uh, you know, in CONCACAF against, you know, Mexican teams. And it, and that's what I, – I love Ray Trafari. Uh, I know that's a throwback name. He's like Ray. Ray. Ray's all over social media these days. Uh, and he's just like – he's that guy that posts and no one really comments on it. But um, anytime they talk about a team struggling and – and those tournaments, Ray says, well, hold up. Like, there wasn't a team that struggled. Not, they didn't just beat the Mexican teams. They they beat the best in South America. And, and that was the time. I mean, it's not – it hasn't happened as recently, but that was when South America was dominating the world club tournaments as well. You know, they'd go to Europe and they'd beat all the teams from around the world. So, um, you know, that I don't think people understand how big that that game was and, and the message it sent. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a new generation and they – they don't want to talk about old DC United being, being the best. I mean, it was, like I said, it was a great time. And we had like 16 national team players on that team. Um, it was special and, you know, nobody will be able to take it away from us. And so, you know, history books will, will see what happens. And at the end of the day, you know, it is part of the past, but, you know, but for those of us that were a part of it, it, it will always be something really special. Okay. Well, let's, let's fast forward. We go to Germany. You talk about, you get a, a pretty big raise. Um, you know, I know, I know Hertha was uh, special for you and uh, you played in some champions league games there, but growing up, I think I was just around, you know, I don't want to date myself or, or, or say, you know, I don't remember where I was. I just remember that you basically helped that team out of relegation. And, and, you know, when I traveled, I backpacked through Europe when I was in college and, um, you know, I had my FIU soccer jacket on and, and people would talk to me about soccer and they'd always ask me if I knew who you were if, or if we knew if I knew you because you were this legend in, in Germany for helping Nuremberg, uh, you know, uh, get promoted. 
you know, talk to me a little bit about being the, the legend in that, in that city. Well, you know, it was a little different. So I went to, to Berlin and we were a champions league team. And, um, you know, I had to leave there because, you know, their coach said he wasn't going to allow me to go play in my national team games because it was too hard on my body. So I switched clubs and I switched positions to Klaus Augenthaler, you know, a German hero. And, um, you know, I went from playing for the Yankees to like the Pittsburgh Pirates in the 70s, right? So <laughs> different city, totally different size, you know, one had a $50 million payroll, one had a $14 million, one had a 70,000 seat stadium, one had a 35. Um, when I got there, they said, listen, you know, you have one object this year. I said, what is it? They said, it is to be in 15th place on the last day of the season. We don't care about anything between now and then. We just need to do that. So, you know, first game we played against Dortmund, and they were the, the top team at the time in the Bundesliga, and we lost 2-0 away. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, my God, we're going to go down. I said, I thought you said it was just the last day, right? So it was stressful because you're playing the whole season in the relegation zone. Um, but we did manage to stay up that year. Um and it was, it was um, before the World Cup, um, and so we ended, you know, it was a great year for me to get in shape the first year, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't you know, really think that much of it, but the town party, and then after the World Cup, you know, I injured my back in, in December, and I think we had 22 points um, at the time, and we were maybe 12th on the table, um, and then I didn't play the second half of the season, and, you know, we didn't have a deep team, so we, we got 11 points in the next 18 games and went down. And so I had been doing rehab and I was gone a year and a half and they wanted to make it a career ending injury um, because of my pay. Um, and so I, I, I knew I could come back and they were like, you know, you're injured. So like eight, like 12 months later, I'm like, I, I called Bruce. I said, Bruce, I'm running. I can play again. And he's like, well, you haven't played a year. So he called me into a national team game um, and I played and he's like, you know, after 20 minutes of my first scrimmage, he's like, yeah, you know, I started against Haiti in a game in Miami. And then you know, I went back to Nuremberg, still didn't play. Um, I played some against game, you know, Portugal. I mean, against uh, Poland. And finally, my team, like, put me in in the game, right? And they put me in and, you know, I came off the bench and, you know, I had this sprint where I caught this guy and everything was like, okay, he's back. And we won the last seven games of the year. Um, won it and came up and I was like, oh, this is cool. That was an understatement. First of all, after the game, you take a bus for like three hours. Then you in a beer tent with 10,000 people and we had to stay there till like 3 a.m. And all 10,000 people sang songs about each one of you and they made you like slam beers the whole time. It was the crazy, I'm like, we just win the Super Bowl or what? It was <laughs> And, and this is what's different about sports here. It's a lot like college football, like your alma mater, or your city can never change. So they were so happy. Um, and, you know, I was happy as well, but um, it was, it was crazy to see, you know, what it meant to them. So once in a lifetime, can never explain it. Never thought like I would see that. Um, and I was just, I, I'm still surprised by it, to be honest with you. Yeah, I was I was shocked, uh, you know, and I had some I had traveled Europe, like I said, backpack in college with some guys that they hated soccer. They loved college football. And uh, people kept asking when we were in Germany, they kept asking if, if I knew you. And they were just they were so weirded out, you know, like, why? Why is everyone asking you this guy? And I was like, he's he's like the only American or one of the only guys here. And he actually plays and he's done well. And, and they were, you know, it was kind of funny. But uh, my, my Nuremberg story. When I was, uh, I tried to go to Europe, uh, I went to Turkey and, you know, Germans, they have that long uh, window in, the, in December uh, where they go and do preseason, usually in Turkey. And we played Nuremberg, who at the time uh, they were, you know, the Bundesliga two. And they, uh, it was like the most comprehensive beating I think I've ever gotten as a, uh, as a professional. They were they were so talented and, and I ended up getting wrecked on a play. I tried to run, you know, we were, we were getting shelled and I tried to flatten the guy. I didn't think he saw me. He did see me. He put his elbow through my eye. My nose was up over here. Uh, you know, broke my, broke my nose, broke my face uh, in like the 87th minute. So they, they shelled me. I broke my face. I just go to the hospital, have surgery. And, and afterwards I'd been mad at my agent. Cause I'd said, why, why am I not getting any deals in Germany? 
He said, oh, well, the only ones you get are Bundesliga 2. And I was like, there's there's no way I'm better than that. And then we played those guys, and I was like, I am not I am not good enough to play in the second division of Germany. But, um, you know, kind of talking on that, you, you've you always been very confident that you were going to play and be, and be the guy. And, um, you know, looking at players now, do you – yeah, I guess it's tough for, for me. I don't, I think the level is a little bit different over there. It's a little higher and, and it's not as uh, comparable to MLS. Do you feel the same way having been through that life or um, how do you interpret it? Yeah, a little bit, but I also think it's like buying a house, right? Like it's hard to buy a house. You need credit, you need history, you need a job, but if you own a house, it's not, it's, it's cheaper than rent. Right. Um, especially you have a duplex. So <laughs> it depends on, you know, where you go. So um, the hardest thing is getting in the door, right? And especially being American. And and even when you're there, it's hard because, you know, culturally, you know, they expect you to adapt, right? And we're not used to that. Um, you know, and people aren't giving us the benefit of the doubt. Right? And I think we have some young Americans now doing great things, which is awesome. I think tactically, that's where we're really missing here. You know, when I, my last couple of years in the MLS, you know, half the team is under 23 years old, which, you know, you had this kind of fight in practice, like the old team versus the young team. But there was enough of the young team together that they actually believed what they were doing was correct. And they were just running off like college soccer with their heads cut off. Right. But it really hurts tactics in practice and have really good training when half of the people don't really understand the game. So I think that's where we, we suffer a little bit. And as teams get more and more mature and we get more, you would say, like mid-level talent. In the MLS, you know, when I played, if you made 120000 and you weren't starting, like you were out, right? But, you know, we need these, you know, four- to eight-year veterans that are making a livelihood that you can count on because they help, you know, teach the kids how to put on their socks, how to play defense, how to do things the right way. And I think that's one of the reasons Bruce Arena has always developed some young talent because he's always surrounded them with a lot of good people, right? You look at Ben Olsen in D.C. He was surrounded, you know, by a, a lot of older players. You know, the young players that came in in L.A., you know, they were surrounded by, by a lot of young older players. So they learned pretty quickly what the difference of right and wrong. Um, and I think that's what hurts American players is tactically um, the younger players – don't see it on a consistent basis. And even in the MLS practices, I don't think we're, we're, we're quite there yet because there's, there's too many young players that tactically um, aren't where they need to be, but it's changing really fast. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. And you know, I think, I think uh, there's too much emphasis on trying to get guys up too soon. I talked to some MLS guys today, just uh, random calls and, I asked, you know, how they're doing, and they, and they said these young guys that they, they just the whole play your youth movement, um, you know, they you know I support it, but I, I also think the guys have to earn it. Like you can't just say, hey, I'm going to play you because you're young, uh, when you know you haven't outperformed or you're not playing better than the guys that are ahead of you, because uh, I think that just sends the wrong message. I know that's important to get experience, but I just uh, I don't I don't agree with you know someone giving giving something just because it's, it's uh, culturally become more accepted and it's like, Oh, that coach plays his youth. So, you know, he's got a better uh, eye for the future. I I don't buy that at all. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you got to win games, right. And you got to earn it. And I think that's one of the challenges here is if you're not in the first team, there's not really a lot of opportunities to get games in to develop real experience. And there's not like a second league um, to develop. So, you know, a lot of young guys come to the MLS and they're forced to play before they're ready and or they don't play. And so they come in at 19 and by 21 or 22, then the league says they've been here three years and they're old and then they bring somebody else in. And, you know, so a lot of times they need to regroup and, and find a different place to connect. And, you know, I think we got to start looking at people's potential and where they're going to be um, and not necessarily where they're at. And take a greater pride in teaching and developing, especially with all the young talent we have. Um, we really have a, a lot of young talent and um, there's just a couple of little things that they can do to improve, but they, they need to do it on the field. Well, I know you talked about um, LA a little bit. You, you know, you, uh, when we played against each other, you were predominantly uh, on those great Chicago fire teams. Um, you know, you were at Columbus, uh, Minnesota, oh, sorry, uh, Colorado, 
Um, you know, what do you consider, you know, do you consider all, like I consider DC and Houston, uh, you know, I spent seven minutes on the field with Atlanta United, so I don't throw Atlanta in the mix, but I consider myself uh, pretty much a DC Houston guy. I mean, what, uh, what do you consider your MLS team or do you kind of look at it as a, as a holistic view? No, I look at where it started. You know, I look at, you know, DC was, you know, where I won my rings and, you know, where the team was and um, where I really broke into becoming a professional. And so that's where I would, where I would lay my hat. And, you know, if I was ever part of any, any hall of fame or anything like that, that's where I'd want to be. And um, that's where I'd have the most connections to. And, um, that's where I felt like I had the most, um, impact, um, over the greatest amount of time. Okay. And then, you know, you, we, you have some ideas clearly on, um, uh, on, on what's, what could be different. You know, you, you've got a wealth of knowledge. We didn't even talk about, um, you know, I, the world cups, you know, all the experience you had on the international stage playing almost 50 games for, for your country. And, um, you know, you, you talk about, I know you're a big believer and you control what you can control. And, you know, it looks like through your foundation, you've, you've done that. You talk about not being political. Uh, I think a lot of people would agree moving up in the soccer world or any world is, is uh, somewhat political. Um, you know, talk to me about if you had an opportunity in the league, where would you, uh, where would you like to help out the most? I would, um, you know, if I thought that there was a clear path to coaching, you know, I would, I would take it. But again, like I'm not going to invest in a, in a dead end job. Um, I think I could help in management, you know, on the, on the, on the sporting side, especially in developing culture. Um, and I really believe in like, you know, you got to set the bar in every organization by setting the culture um, around the philosophy of working hard, being honest, um, but being enjoyable, right? Like you, you, you've been in locker rooms where it's fun to be around and, um, but it becomes of respecting the game and respecting each other. And then the other role I, I wouldn't mind is, um, you know, working with the, with the teams as a coach, but really working with that group of players from 17 to 23. Um, like I said, too many of them wash out. And, and I believe that, you know, given special attention and the right attention, you know, they could make huge, huge strides. And uh, they just need a little more, a um, little more care and, and, you know, just making, you know, one or two less errors here or there can go a long way. And, you know, I think that would be my specialty in, in being able to develop young players from going from prospect and talent to actually, you know, key players on teams. Yeah, and, and the you, you made a couple interesting points in some of the stuff I've seen. It's not just you. Uh, I feel kind of uh, the same way. I know like Landon Donovan, Demarcus Beasley, some of the more recent names. Um, a lot of guys feel like they put their time in and they, and they, they wore the badge, you know, not just for the club, but in your case uh, for the national team. And they're, they're always a little bit um, shocked, I guess that, and I'm, I'm as baffled as anybody by this uh, on, on guys like you and, and, and bees and, and Landon that there aren't a lot of opportunities uh, when the game ends for them, no one comes knocking, no one comes calling. And I use things like that as an example. When I talk to, these guys that are retiring or looking to retire, a lot of them think, oh, I'm just going to wait around and see what happens when, uh, when I'm done playing. And, and the reality is, is, is there is no call. There is no knock. Um, you know, guys don't – that I think that don't take their future into their own hands are usually the guys that are the most unhappy and they're a little bit depressed. And I'm saying if it's not happening for guys like you and guys like those guys I named, um, you know, and I, I wish – I wish it could be different. And I think there's more people out there that are worried about their own jobs and they, they're, they're more out to keep uh, guys that have played the game down because they say they don't deserve it or they're not fitting uh, for this role. But, um, you know, what do you tell all these guys and, and kids, guys and girls that you work with um, in terms of controlling their own destiny? And, and, you know, what's the message you, you relay having been through that experience yourself? Well, first, I mean, you got to look at yourself in the mirror every day and be happy with who you are and what you can give. You know, um, I, I was able to do that as a player. Um, I'm able to do that now. Um, you know, I know coaches took a chance on me and I would like to think and, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty down to earth person, but I'm not short on confidence. And 
I would say that I believe that I made every team I've ever been a part of better. Um, and I believe I could still do that today. So when I see teams struggling um, and I look at some of the players out there with wealth of experience, like yourself, like Eddie Popes, like Beasley, um, I just, you know, I wonder why some people are trying to reinvent the wheel instead of investing in good people, right? Good people that had success. Um, and, you know, I think that's why like building culture is, is really important. You know, I think to younger players, you know, if you want to, if you think you want to do something like that afterwards, you really have to start, you know, being political and investing in it. But you also have to show the world that you're serious about it, right? I think there's been some players that have, have you know, go get their coaching license early, start talking to their coaches. You know, you want that idea to be on people's mind. And then I was talking, you know, I, you know, I think Fernando Clavijo probably would have hired me before I went to play to LA to be an assistant coach. And, um, you know, I wasn't ready. And, you know, I was talking to, you know, Doc Manabom and, and he was like, you know, how do you know when the right time to retire is? And, you know, they say, you know, you should retire. Don't play when playing is going to affect your next job. Right. So when you're high enough where people want you around because of who they think you are, where you're going to get a TV job or, your name has some cachet, that's when you should retire. Um, the day after you retire, it's no different than being 20 years. So you, you become a next player and there's a million of us. So it's great while you're playing, but you know, you have a lot more leverage while you're playing to make those decisions and, and build those networks. So, you know, use them while you can, because the day after you retire, you know, no matter what league you played in, you know, we're all in a bucket, of a bunch of has-beens and, you know, it, that's the reality of it. But um, I think that's why, you know, when I look at a guy like you and, and some of the other players, I think we, we respect each other. We know that there's a, a small, you know, fraternity of people that saw or played the game at that level that, that you respect, um, you know, that, that competed or that you shared a locker room with. Um, but at the end of the day, I just tell young people, like, you know, you, you got to be good with what you're doing. And if you want to stay in the game, then you got to start investing in it early um, to let people know that you want to. Otherwise, you know, no one's going to come knocking on your door for any reason. Well, yeah, I mean, now that, now that you're the mayor of Minnesota, do you think they could even uh, afford you? Well, <laughs> you check my contract. Um, you know, I'd be happy to help the team there. And I have some friends that work for the team. And, you know, in some day, in some capacity, I think there'll be um, leadership there that, that will connect on. Um, I do think I have a lot to give the game and the community itself. And I'm still doing that to the game of soccer. Um, you know, they're doing quite well. And, you know, I work with a couple of the young players on the team and, um, you know, there's a lot of players on the team that are also ambassadors for the Sana foundation, um, you know, that are doing pretty well. And I know, you know, Ike was, um, defender of the year and, you know, going through some, you know, injury right now and, um, Mason and, and Hassani, you know, have, volunteered with us and, um, you know, Michelle Ibarra before he, um, Miguel Ibarra before he left. So, you know, there's still the players that are still supporting the organization and I'm able to support them too um, on a personal level, which is, which has been good as well. Yeah. And, and for those that don't follow Tony on social media, he's, uh, he's on there. He's, he's got a, a better photographer sense than, than I do it for sure. You get some, some good Instagram photos and you can see a lot of those guys on there, um, you know, promoting your cause. Uh, you talked about the community. Um, you know, it's it's an interesting thing what happened with George Floyd. Um, when I say interesting, it's probably not the right word. It's a horrible thing what happened. But you were uh, on the ground level there. I know you've you've marched. Uh, you protested peacefully with with the community, um, and it's it's kind of uh, evolved organically now into all you know all American life and and not just American life, but um, you know, I think we're catching up, unfortunately, to some of the other parts of the world that were supporting, uh, you know, Kaepernick and some of these different causes well before uh, American sports were. Um, can you talk about your role now? I know you've joined um, you've joined on with some groups. Uh, you're, you're helping out. You're helping control the narrative. You're helping uh, promote voting. I know you, you take a very non-political stance on a lot of this, but um, can we talk about basically how this has affected you? Um, you know, having been in Germany, where it was one of the most racist countries in the world uh, for to soccer players, to uh, playing in MLS, and now being a leader in the community in Minnesota, where 
uh, you know, it's the forefront that caused this, this Black Lives Matter movement? Yeah, and first of all, you know, being on the positive, you know, my hats is off to Germany now. If you look at a U-turn of what a country, uh, my old team, Hertha Berlin, actually knelt in, in um, to support Colin Kaepernick two years ago. So nobody talked about it, right? And um, they recently toured the USA, and the theme of their tour was bringing down the wall. And it was a pun on the wall there and the U.S. border wall. So really about inclusivity. Um, you know, we, we we do try to stay political, but we still stand for what we believe in, you know, as, a, as an organization and me as a person. And, you know, anytime someone gets killed or murdered, you know, you want to stand up for what's right. You know, being an African-American and having to play through some of these things. And, you know, quite honestly, that's one of the reasons why I didn't stay in pro soccer, because, you know, as a player, you know, Speed doesn't lie and neither do stats, right? But you start to go into management and buddy system. I just knew that, you know, that, you know, I was going to be described in a way that wasn't going to be based on what I would be able to bring a team. Um, so I knew that there wouldn't be opportunities there. And, and I valued myself too much to, to put myself in that situation. Um, you know, right now, I think it's an important time for the whole world to, to work together. Um, you know, we have been in talks, with, you know, through SCORE. Um, a collective that, that I'm part of to, to work with the league and, and others um, to support, you know, racial equity and, and the advancement of, of people of color, but, you know, also promote peace. And I, I look at myself as a player that, you know, I, I played every position and I could go in the room um, or to dinner with anybody on my team. You know, I think, you know, understanding other people um, is the best way to, it's hard to hate someone, you know, right. Uh, unless there's really just something about them. <laughs> I think, um, you know, getting to know people and, you know, getting rid of our biases um, is, is the way to move the needle forward. So, you know, I, I try to help some of the young players and I try to, you know, on the, on the ground level here, you know, work with my community to make sure that the young people, you know, have every opportunity that they can, um, but also educate others on, on, on equality and, and, and stereotypes as well. So, we got a lot of work ahead of us and we're not going to solve, you know, 200 years, you know, in 30 days, but I think there's organizations that are, and people that are committed to, to social change and, um, and kind of to start looking at things differently. And, you know, it's, it's a trying time for all of us. And all I can say is, you know, you know, we, we really need to look at intent, right. You know, what are people intending to do and, you know, I, I, oftentimes we should we say people should know better or not. But, you know, if somebody intends to do well and they don't, you know, can we educate them? Right. Because I don't want to hurt your feelings. So if you tell me that I am, I can change the way I'm acting because actually I want my actions to be in line with my beliefs. So I think we got to give some people the the. You know, give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, but we, at the same time, we have to hold people accountable um, and and we have to be OK with, you know, hearing things we don't like. And I think we're all going to grow together. Um, but, you know, we're going to have to be vulnerable and we're going to have to, you know, not be right a lot. And we're going to have to be willing to learn if, if things are going to get different. Well, I mean, I, I reemphasize it again that you you. One, you're so well spoken, and uh, you know you've you've done an incredible thing in this foundation and some of the community work you're doing. Can you, uh, for the people that are listening and checking in, um, you know, what can people do from home, from wherever they are, anywhere in the world? Is there is there something they can do to help, uh, you know, promote your cause and, and help with some of the stuff that you guys have going on? Yeah, well, one, you can follow me or our organization on social media. Um, sometimes there's opportunity to donate or support different causes. I think that that'd be helpful. Um, I think, you know, in your own area where you live, I think, you know, sometimes we promote other organizations or just look at how you can give back and it might not always be financially, but, you know, can you pick three organizations that you support and at a minimum support them on social media and highlight everything that they do. So more people learn about them, support them. Um, and then sometimes even see them to get help from them. So I think those are some easy things you can do to support us and, and others in your own community. 
Well, Tony, I appreciate you so much for coming on. I, I was thrilled when uh, when you agreed to do this. I, I think not just from, uh, you know, you've had quite an impressive soccer career, uh, but as a guy who's transitioning from soccer into a, a new role, I see how hard it is, um, you know, to, to start over. And I feel like, like I said, that snowball has, has really gained some momentum. I, I think uh, as a as an alum of the league, I'm, I think I'm more proud of what you've done post-career with your platform uh, than almost any other player I've seen out there. So, um, you know, congrats to you and good luck going forward. If there's anything from the PA side that we can do to help, we, we would love to, uh, you know, as, as long as we follow our, by our guidelines and, and things of that nature. But um, thank you so much for coming on today. I, I know that uh, American soccer fans are, are you got to love this and, and MLS fans too get to see kind of where the league was to where it is now and, and, and hear from uh, kind of someone that's really, really well spoken about what they think should uh, improve the league going forward. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nice talking to you. Any DC players, always a teammate. So good to see you. Same to you. All right, Tony.